The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I promised everybody that we would have um, the capability of testing a multi-junction solar cell. Um, we've been working so far with uh, single junction crystalline silicon. And uh, just to refresh everybody about what a multi-junction device is, um, it is a high efficiency concept. Uh, the efficiencies that are obtained under concentrated sunlight uh, are above 40% now with some of these uh, high efficiency concentrated devices. And um, the, again, the, the way this uh, concentrated device works is if you have, for example, germanium, gallium arsenide, indium gallium phosphide stack, uh, three different materials, three different band gaps uh, ranging from uh, somewhere in the range of 0.67 EV uh, all the way up to a, a few EV. Um, the largest band gap is placed at the top, right, because the short wavelength light is absorbed by that one, and the longer wavelength lights go through and are absorbed by uh, the layers underneath. So you can think about this as uh, blue, <laughs> uh, orange, and red if you like to see things in colors, uh, the short wavelength light being the blue absorbed at the top, um, the sunlight obviously coming in through that side, through the top, uh, the middle cell uh, absorbing the light somewhere in the, in the middle of the solar spectrum and the bottom cell uh, into the reds. Um, so the notion is to have a device that is capable of uh, minimizing thermalization losses. Right? So uh, the uh, short wavelength light, instead of uh, being absorbed in a low band gap material and generating a ton of uh, heat uh, in, in the process, uh, is able to be absorbed very efficiently uh, via that top cell. And only the longest wavelength light, the lowest energy light, makes it down to the small band gap material underneath. So this is representative of the uh, stack of materials that we have. I believe what we're going to do is do a direct comparison of silicon versus multi-junction. Is that right? Um, yeah, so right now we have installed the silicon devices. Uh, those are the very nicely encapsulated ones. Um, we had to change the light source. As you see now, we have a little bit of a, uh, a, a flashlight there. Uh, why is that? Why did we have to go from an LED, a monochromatic light source, to a broadband uh, flashlight? Well, the, the point is that you have these different, uh, different absorber layers that absorb different wavelengths of light. You only put one wavelength at it, other layers wouldn't have to that. And it kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah. Plus, um, the current outputs of these three different cells have to be more or less matched, right? So uh, because they're connected in series, um, if you have a, a, a poor performing cell uh, or one component, one subcell, if you will, uh, that is generating a small amount of current, um, that will limit the combined uh, current output of that entire stack. Good. So why don't we go ahead and connect them to our computers. We have our uh, tech support staff available on call who just walked out uh, conveniently, but we'll be back momentarily. Um, we'll connect them to our computers, uh, fire it up, and uh, team up with uh, somebody if you don't happen to have a computer with you. Uh, we'll get this. Uh, We'll get this demo started. So the notion here is to first test the silicon-based device. Uh, once we have a good working IV curve out of the silicon-based device, um, we'll talk about, uh, we'll take a pause, we'll talk about what we would expect to see from the multi-junction device uh, when we hook that one up. So why don't we go to it and, um, and give it a shot. So um, let me, uh, let me dive into what is effectively our last uh, in-class lecture uh, before we, uh, we are uh, graced with, uh, with some really nice uh, presentations. I'm looking forward to those. So um, global trends, uh, what I decided to talk the last day about, um, really we have a couple of topics left, uh, which we don't have time to cover. Uh, we, we won't have time to cover both. We'll have time to cover one, but not the other. And the two topics are the future of R&D, in solar, and the other topic is solar in developing countries. And I think both are equally important. Um, I decided to pick the former rather than the latter. Um, global investments, trends in solar and other renewables. What I wanted to do was briefly walk through uh, some of the, the recent trends in uh, R&D. So energy companies traditionally are not R&D spenders. Uh, they invest or reinvest a very small fraction of their profits in, uh, in R&D, in research and development. 
And solar, because it is uh, uh, far from grid parity right now, uh, factor two, factor three in terms of cost, uh, not price, cost, we have to uh, invest R&D to get uh, the, the cost down. And this has both manufacturing innovation and of course uh, engineering scientific innovation. Uh, so this right here is um, financial investment in clean energy, global trends by quarter. Uh, I've decided to compile as much data as I possibly could uh, into these slides so that you can go on afterward. Um, if you're really interested in the topic, pursue it further. And uh, what we see is, is a rise overall of, of investment in so-called clean energy. Um, and by and large, by the G20, these are uh, countries that have access to resources, to capital, um, large, larger GDPs on average. Um, you also see a trend in, uh, in, in non-G20 uh, countries, um, more recently uh, in uptick, a recognition that this is an important area. And perhaps there's room to play niches, if you will, that um, certain countries can adopt that, um, that would provide a competitive advantage. This is an interesting chart as well. Um, this shows uh, the uh, investment uh, in, uh, I believe that this is government R&D. Um, oh, this is financial sector investment only. Excludes corporate and government R&D, uh, small distributed capacity um, in both. So financial sector investment in uh, the US and China. What we see in the US is relatively stable investment um, start, picked up in the mid 2000s, but relatively stable throughout. Um, and in China, just a, a really steady increase here of, of R&D funding. Note the, the role of the market in the United States. Right around 05 and 06, this was when the price of PV began to plateau. The cost continued coming down, but the price of PV modules began to plateau because of the silicon feedstock shortage. Right? So people saw opportunity here, especially the financial sector, uh, private capital, and said, well, hey, um, if prices are remaining high, and the costs are coming down, that means our profit margin is growing, this is a good industry for us to get into, a high profit margin industry. So there are many uh, folks getting in because of that market condition. Um, some of them saw the future of the market and said this is trending towards commodities, we have to adopt that mentality and really squeeze every penny out of our cost structure that we can do. Um, and others went into it thinking that this would be a, a bumper crop, uh, a really high yield uh, investment. And then as the, price, uh, the margins began to get squeezed, uh, they got scared and some pulled out. So it's an interesting uh, trend following the market uh, perturbations in the United States and, and having this, this fluctuation. Uh, and in China, uh, from what I can tell discussing with business leaders and politicians, a much more premeditated long-term strategy saying this is a strategic industry for our country, we are going to invest in it, and this is of fundamental national importance. So a little bit of difference um, in the investment strategies of the two. The EU is a little bit in between, uh, a mixed bag. Again, this uptick in the middle of the 2000s, um, but, um, but a, a, a continued investment in, in PV and, and renewables. Um, this shows the investment type by sector, um, broken down on, on the right-hand side between the renewable energy types. Uh, so you have wind, solar, other renewables, biofuels, and uh, so-called megawatts, um, so-called uh, uh, energy efficiency. And on the left-hand side, we have the different types of investment um, into uh, clean tech. And interestingly, here in the United States, this in 2009, uh, venture capital is uh, comprising a, a surprising uh, total of, of the investment in, um, in renewable energy. And uh, in terms of the sector itself, uh, we can see solar here in the United States comprising a large uh, percentage, again, of uh, the total investment. I want to bring caution to one data point up there. Spain, that was a little bit of a short-term fluke. Um, the, the Spanish government instituted a, a feed-in tariff similar to what Germany has, has implemented, uh, but a little less successfully. Let me dive into the details. Germany uh, did a careful market analysis, was the first to move into the space, and began dominating the market for PV, 50% of PV installed. So if Germany set the price a little differently, the PV market would adjust accordingly. Spain, a new entrant, seeing Germany's success, decided to replicate it. The first time they attempted a feed-in tariff, um, their feed-in tariff came in too low, and the market looked at Spain, shrugged their shoulders, and continued investing in, in installing in Germany. The second time they decided to come in, they put their feed-in tariff a little bit too high. <laughs> and as a result, the market said, really, you kidding? Okay, we go there and install. And there was this slosh of modules over to Spain. 
uh, flooding the market. And over a period of about a year to two years, they got much more than they bargained for. In other words, they had many, many more modules installed than they had expected. And now the government has to pay out to these module, manuf uh, the, the, the installed systems, they have to pay out a certain rate uh, based on the feed-in tariff. And it was more than they expected to have to pay out. Then the financial crisis hits. So it was a little bit of a disaster because um, they ended up killing the program, uh, killing in the process about 10 years of work uh, to design the program, 10 years of institution building to think about how to create a feed-in tariff for Spain and um, with, uh, without the desired result, which was a uh, slow, steady increase of the photovoltaic uh, installations in Spain and, and hence the local industry. Uh, so it was a little bit of a, a flash in the pan, a huge market that, that burst very suddenly and then quickly extinguished itself. So it's a good example of how not to, to perform a feed-in tariff, how not to design a feed-in tariff. Um, so that's, in 2009, that was uh, uh, the end of the bumper year investment. Um, Spain also did something that was pretty nasty from a, a government policy point of view. Um, they decided to retroactively change their feed-in tariff. Ooh. <laughs> so <laughs> feed-in tariff is, an is a contract between uh, the, the government or the utility and the installer, right, saying that we will pay a certain amount per year for a number of years. And um, to go back on that and renege on, on, on the feed-in tariff, that's, that's a no-no. Um, it, it undermines market confidence. So um, the, the PV module prices, I, I just wanted to highlight this slide once again uh, to highlight the, the market conditions that are being experienced right now. We had in, in the mid-2000s um, a rise in uh, or uh, fairly steady uh, prices. And meanwhile, costs were coming down. Uh, this, by the way, is, is price but in thin films. Uh, first solar, can tell. Uh, these blue dots here being crystalline silicon. And um, the prices remained fairly steady. And then in the, say, 2008 uh, to 2011, prices have dropped precipitously. Um, 2011 numbers, you're uh, at or slightly below a dollar. So you can see for somebody who is, is being driven uh, by, by market conditions, this is extremely unsettling and um, uh, causes uh, uh, capital to uh, uh, fluctuate back and forth. Now, the same thing, what is happening here in the solar modules, the inverse is happening in the installations. So the installers are seeing the price of their modules go down and the price of their installations declining steadily, but, but, but more or less staying fixed because of the investment tax credit staying fixed and so forth in the US and utility prices rising. And so the installers are saying, hey, this is great. So their profit margins are really big. Warning to anybody to try and get into the sector right now, think carefully about these market dynamics in the United States and in Europe and how that will affect your business. Right? If you're trying to get into the solar uh, absorber, as in module, manufacturing business, or if you're trying to get into the equipment manufacturing business, or in the installation side on the grid, think about how these market dynamics are going to affect your, your business as it grows and tries to gain a foothold in this environment. It's a great time to be a new installer company, but in three or four years, when we're in an undersupply condition again and prices might even go up, uh, what then? Right, so think about these, uh, these, these topics. Um, we're talking about our, uh, renewable energy R&D and the technology pipeline. So it's important to recognize the uh, path that many of these new technologies take to go from concept or idea into full-scale manufacturing. So uh, in general, this is the path followed in the United States. And we have uh, technology research happening at places like, like this at MIT. Uh, the rollout, uh, in other words, the, uh, the um, installations and, and large-scale uh, uh, manufacturing on the other side. And there are many uh, funding sources available for that. Um, not so much this last one here in the United States, um, but maybe in Australia or Europe, um, in select regions of the US. This technology development right here in the middle has been what is referred to as the valley of death. Does anybody know why, what, what that means, valley of death? What, what is it? It's a period when it's difficult to get funding from any source. Now imagine you're a group of, of, of postdocs and students in the lab. You come up with a new fancy technology, and you can't quite get the venture capital or private equity necessary to kick off your company. Um, that would be one, I would say, mini valley of death. Um, it's, it's, it's fairly uh, avoided here in the US. Good ideas have a tendency to get funded uh, at that stage. But if you don't get funded, 
Then the postdoc gets another position over here, becomes a professor at a university across the country. The student goes off and does a postdoc in another place. And now all of a sudden, three, five, six months later, the venture capitalist rolls around to the professor who's still here at MIT and kind of has a hollowed out group at this point and says, wow, it's a great idea. I'd like to invest in it. Where's your team? <laughs> yeah, poof. Um, so that's one uh, possible mechanism uh, wherein technologies don't make it forward, right? And so keeping the team together is extremely important. The second valley of death can happen right between technology development and manufacturing and scale up. We've seen uh, some of these, uh, we've seen pictures of some of the factories. They, they, they're, they're around here in the countryside. These are oftentimes tens, more likely hundreds of millions of dollars investments. Right? And venture capital funds tend to be on the order of hundreds of millions to a billion dollars. They don't like investing in large uh, asset goods. They don't like investing in factories. They'd rather invest in a small group of people with a computer uh, set in, 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 in a garage, um, maybe put in a couple tens of thousands of dollars and, and turn around the profit of a few million. That's the type of investment that makes a lot of sense for venture capital. Um, when you start investing in fixed goods, in brick and mortar, um, you need other forms of financing. Right? And some countries around the world have been very adept in providing this financing. Uh, China in particular has done a great job at making that type of financing available for uh, companies that are small and looking to expand. But in the United States, it's very difficult to, to access these, uh, uh, essentially money from banks especially, for new technology. The bank will say, well, why am I investing in you? Um, I could be investing in something that's much more sure of a bet, uh, today's technology, instead of investing in something risky. So the government has stepped in with a variety of programs to try to ease that inefficiency in the market. Right? And so one of the means are, are loans. Um, loan guarantee program, for example, was one mechanism. Um, there's a Sun Path program that's coming down the pipeline as well. Uh, so we have uh, venture capital and private equity, but that can only take you so far, typically. They invest a few tens of millions of dollars. Um, in a few rare cases, a few hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, but then they reach the end of their credit line, if you will. They exhaust their ability to invest and what's needed to expand manufacturing is typically on the order of hundreds of millions to billions of dollars to reach hundreds of megawatts, gigawatts scale. So that's the second big valley of death in the United States that exists. And the way co some companies are, are transitioning across that valley, uh, they find a variety of means. Some go overseas. They say, hey, uh, the uh, Central Bank of China is willing to invest money in me. I go there and I set up manufacturing. Um, other companies, uh, small companies might say, well, uh, GE, um, you have a big finance group within your big umbrella company. Why don't you buy us and then we can gain access to capital and expand our manufacturing plant. Um, others form partnerships with, uh, uh, with banks. Um, it, it's, it's a mixed, um, uh, mixed set of, of business strategies. But if you look around at some of the, the startup companies that are now entering small scale production, um, there are, this is where the, the business side of the creativity comes in play. And that's where you really need a good business developer at hand uh, to arrange those deals for you. Um, in terms of uh, where the money is, um, in terms of clean tech in general, uh, these are some figures in terms of, of 2009 data. I'm sure uh, we can get some more up-to-date figures as well. Um, and in terms of growth and investment, uh, we see some countries that might be rather surprising. Right, in terms of the, the, the five-year growth of investment in renewables. Obviously, if you start from a very small number, um, you can grow pretty quick in terms of percents. Uh, but it's still interesting to see uh, the development of, of, of some countries here. Um, this is sobering. Uh, so this is the uh, US government R&D by budget function, uh, 55 to 97, uh, the most comprehensive data set I could find. Um, I'm sure that there are graphs that extend this into the future. If you happen to have one, I'd be happy to see it. But uh, the, the basic story of this graph is the following. The lion's share of R&D is going to the Defense Department. So it would be Army Research Office, Office of Naval Research, um, DARPA, um, that's uh, the Advanced Research Program, um, a variety of, of uh, night vision labs and so forth. These are a variety of defense uh, R&D. And there is trickle down. There's some trickle down of technologies being developed in, in defense uh, into, um, into civilian uses. And so I don't want to uh, point to this and say it's a boogeyman uh, by no means, but it, it, it does indicate national priorities in terms of R&D research. The other big one is health. So NIH, National Institutes of Health, 
that's growing and expanding. It's very easy to go to uh, Congress people and senators um, who might be uh, advancing in their years and say, hey, we need money for Alzheimer's research or we need money for cancer research, right? That's, uh, it's a, it, it, it resonates. It's easy to convince people of that. Um, energy is small, traditionally. Um, let me dive forward into a, 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 this going a little bit further. This is non-defense R&D funding pushed out to 2004. Uh, again, you can see health really driving things. Uh, energy traditionally uh, in, 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 let's see, the Jimmy Carter years right around here, it expanded a bit. Uh, this was a renewables burst. That's where the National Renewable Energy Laboratory was founded, originally called the Solar Energy Research Institute, or SERI. Um, and then got crimped down again and uh, really experienced a, a bit of a, um, a pinch in the U.S. right when solar was really beginning to take off in Japan. So this is when uh, solar cell production by Sharp uh, was really beginning to climb uh, in the uh, late 90s to early 2000s. And then, of course, Germany followed and the rest of the world. So we've been a little bit behind, uh, step by step. And um, the interesting thing that many people have looked into is what sort of correlation exists between US government R&D spending and output of new ideas. And the output of new ideas, the metric that they're using for this are patents. So you could dispute that. Um, you could say, well, patents aren't the best indicator of new ideas. Sometimes new ideas are of diffuse benefit, and they help all industries, but you can't really patent the idea. Fine, but um, this is, I think, the most quantitative comparison that, that folks have performed. Uh, this is an interesting study where um, folks looked at the number of patents granted and energy funds, uh, or en energy R&D funding, and uh, plotted as a function of year, and saw a strong correlation between uh, uptick of um, national priority and government funding and uh, innovation. So this was the first wave of innovation in, uh, in energy and, and in PV, uh, specifically uh, in the late 1970s when the OPEC oil crises hit in the United States and there was a big push for renewable energy development. Yes, question? Uh, just patents in energy or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So these are, 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 are pushed down. And we can dive into um, patents just for PV, uh, which is this graph right here. And this was an updated uh, version of that earlier study by uh, Dan Kamen. Uh, this earlier stu study by uh, Robert Margolis. Uh, Robert Margolis is now at NREL, National, Re National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and he works on uh, market assessment there. Oopsie. Uh, Gregory Nemet um, was a student at the time uh, with Dan Kamen, uh, produced this wonderful uh, continuation of the study, um, published a few years later. And again, broke it down into specific, uh, um, specific um, technologies, including photovoltaics, and saw, again, some correlation uh, between the number of patents and, and public R&D. Um, in the mid-2000s, this really, st I mean, the number of patents has started to grow as startup companies got into the fray. Remember, when prices stayed flat and costs continued coming down and those margins increased, a bunch of players got into that space and said, ooh, we can make money. Um, so a number of patents were filed, a number of startup companies got off the ground. Um, again, uh, funding patent correlation for energy in general, uh, I provide you the data, you can dive into it in more detail if you like, not only PV but other uh, technologies. Interesting. Global trends in venture investing, since venture investing is important for you specifically, uh, it's one of the pathways to get ideas out of the university and into, um, uh, into a startup company. We, we talked about this uh, so far. And, um, and uh, okay, so we're, we're diving a little bit deeper here. Uh, this is for uh, the venture capital private equity financing by sector in 2009, uh, looking specifically at solar in the United States. Uh, comprised a large fraction of it. Solar continues to comprise a large fraction of venture investment, surprisingly, despite the market conditions right now. Because uh, folks, especially in the, in the VC community, are looking at today's market as an opportunity. Uh, they think that if enough people are scared out of the market, uh, that they'll be able to remain there and pick up the good ideas. And if they're only a little bit smarter than their competition, uh, they can pick up uh, the right companies in the right segments of the value chain. Uh, maybe an equipment manufacturer, maybe an installer with a new idea. Um, and avoid some of the pain that's going on right now in wafer fabrication and cell fabrication upstream. Um, this was uh, it, uh, the uh, VC investment in solar uh, right here um, in those boom years that I mentioned. Right. So during the years uh, when prices started to, to plateau uh, because of the silicon feedstock shortage in the mid-2000s, uh, you saw this massive uptick of investment in venture capital funding. That scale is in millions of dollars. 
you're exceeding a billion dollars of VC funding in solar in 2007. And that trend continued in 2008. So uh, still to this day, we're, we're, we're seeing hundreds of millions of dollars plowed into solar uh, by venture capital funds. It's interesting, really interesting. Um, the number of startup companies in the United States has proliferated. Uh, there are, I think, somewhere in the order of, of over 200 solar startup companies worldwide. Um, there are a few that have failed. Um, so uh, Wakanda, Solasta, uh, SV Solar, Synergen, OptiSolar, Solyndra, SpectraWatt, uh, Evergreen Solar. Uh, these are all, I'd say, failed companies that, by the definition of failure, bankruptcy. I mean, by that metric, so as United Airlines failed and American Airlines failed, they're still around. Um, they restructured under bankruptcy protection. Um, some have closed their doors entirely. Um, other ones have, have restructured um, or are in the process of restructuring. Um, why each of these companies have failed? Uh, different reasons. You can't uh, claim that each one had the exact same trajectory, but you can definitely point to certain market conditions as influencing uh, or, or, or precipitating their failure. Uh, let me be more specific. Um, these companies right here are all uh, wafer or thin film device and module manufacturers. They're the upstream components. Right? These aren't installation companies. These aren't installers failing. These are upstream uh, manufacturers failing, and, um, and a few high-profile ones at that. Uh, so that was precipitated by the, the recent market conditions, the, the uh, capital crunch. Um, it, it began with uh, some of the uh, companies, say, in, in OptiSolar in 2009, I believe. Uh, they were a company that was producing amorphous silicon modules. And as we studied amorphous silicon, the efficiencies are low, right? The amorphous silicon module efficiency is in the order of 6%. And they said, well, never mind that our cost structure is a little high. We're going to scale up like nobody's business. We're going to ramp up manufacturing capacity to over a gigawatt and do it really, really quick. And just by sheer scale alone, we'll be able to drive down costs and get us to the point where we're competitive on a cents per kilowatt hour basis with crystal and silicon. It was a great business plan in theory. Um, but uh, what happened uh, to them was when they went out to try to raise money, uh, they couldn't find any right around 2008. It was the beginning of the financial crisis, right? So they had the business plan in mind, and on paper it looked great, but when it came time to raise the funding to grow, they didn't have it. And even though they had a guaranteed um, uh, customer, uh, PG&E, uh, that was the Pacific Gas and Electric, the California utility, they just could not get the financing to expand uh, their, ca their, their, their factory. Um, so what ended up happening was they folded, sold the, uh, uh, the uh, supply stream, if you will, to First Solar, picked it up for pennies in the dollar, and first solar modules ended up going in uh, the PG&E um, uh, field installations instead of the OptiSolar amorphous silicon. Each company has its own story right? and uh, have failed for different reasons. Um, what's clear is also there are more failed up start startups coming. Um, this is a time of, of financial pain for them. Uh, the prices are very, very low. Um, and there are a few people who are tracking um, the, these uh, uh, Startup companies, uh, I would say Eric Westhoff from Green Tech Media is probably one of the most active in publishing his, uh, his insights. Um, that said, there are many promising companies among here, and some of these um, hopefully will become household names for good reasons in the future uh, as they um, uh, have an innovation that significantly drives down cost over their competitors. We're going to get to that in a few slides. We're going to talk about how to evaluate a company uh, because it's going to be important for you. Near term, because you might want a job, or you might want to form, form your own company. Uh, longer term, because you might become an investor in PV, and you'll have to figure out what types of companies make sense to invest in and which don't. Um, in terms of startup companies in the New England area, uh, we often uh, think of ourselves as kind of, you know, uh, maybe a second fiddle to Silicon Valley, but there's a lot going on in the region, um, and a lot of good work. Uh, so if you go to cleanenergycouncil.org and cluster map, you'll see a, a map of the local uh, clean tech companies in, in the region. I'll leave this slide up there since I see a few of you jotting notes. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a useful map and you can select by sector as well if you look at solar or look at uh, biofuels and so forth. All right. Um, trends in renewable energy manufacturing. Um, this slide is a little bit outdated, um, but it's the green tech media research map of uh, manufacturing in the United States uh, of the different solar technologies, uh, 
Again, a bit outdated. There are a few companies that have uh, changed, um, but it, it gives you a sense of what uh, the distribution is. What are the latest trends of manufacturing in the United States? The latest trends of manufacturing, if I were to point to a few of them, Mississippi has emerged as uh, a big manufacturing state. Why? What does, what does the Southeast, first off, who's from the Southeast here? Show of hands, one, two. All right, what do you have in this region right around here that the rest of the country doesn't have? Uh, close, coal. You have a lot of coal. You have uh, 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 nuclear as well. Uh, the TVA, does anybody know what the TVA is? Tennessee Valley Authority, right? That's a, a big um, uh, public works project, in fact, uh, that got started. And it provides uh, low-cost electricity um, to this entire region right up here, including northern Mississippi, including some of the northern portions of the, uh, the, the far southeast states. Bottom line, you have uh, depressed wages, by and large, in these rural communities, and low-cost electricity, which if labor and, 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 and utilities matter, which it does in solar manufacturing, it's, it's ripe for manufacturing. And you have many startup companies, um, Stion, Cali Solar, uh, Twin Creeks, and others that have moved into the Mississippi region uh, in, in very recent uh, months uh, for that region, for that reason. Um, you have, uh, uh, let's see, Suniva was based in, in Georgia, Atlanta. Um, Ohio still continues to be uh, the northwest uh, as well, cheap hydro. Um, not exactly cheap wages, but, but cheap hydro. And um, you know, the, the technologies do tend to stay closer to um, the places where they were born. Uh, you can see in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's a propensity of, 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 to, to form startup companies and new technologies as well as in the Massachusetts area. Uh, so these are, are focusing on, on some of the medium scale manufacturers. In terms of manufacturing support, this is what local state governments are doing to help form new companies in the United States, you have as well a variety of mechanisms, grants, loans, tax credits, and so forth for new factories that are trying to start up. So keep that in mind if you're uh, going for it. And um, market incentives, uh, in terms of the, 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 the three, uh, Germany, US, and China, you also have to consider Korea, Japan, uh, India, Brazil, other countries as well in this mix if you really want a global perspective. But this dumbs it down to three. Um, in terms of what uh, incentives are available for different countries, um, there is, a, a, there is a, a plethora of different incentives which can help uh, the, the market pull. Okay, so we, we go back and, and have a clearer picture of what's happening, at least in the US, uh, with its investment, uh, the VC investment, as well as manufacturing, uh, the next step uh, on the state level. So we're collecting some data points there. So this, um, this is interesting. If your money is from the bank, let's say, and you're paying an interest rate on it, and you want to start a new factory, but then your local inspector comes back to you and says, well, we're going to have to delay by three months because of reason X, Y, and Z. Now you're paying interest on the money, uh, potentially, and, um, but you're not generating profits off of it, right? So delays cost money. Uh, the project delays cost money. It's also an opportunity cost. And so um, there was a, a, a study done a few, a, a, a few uh, uh, years ago looking into why, why it is that renewable energy projects are delayed. And they came up with some interesting region-dependent region conclusions as a result of the study, uh, whether it's transmission limitations. Uh, Texas, there have even been cases in New York of uh, transmission lines uh, having limited capacity for renewables. Um, financing constraints, power purchase agreement um, weaknesses, Permitting, uh, that could be a big uh, slowdown if that's not streamlined. Um, financing and permitting, <laughs> and negligible market, uh, local market. And again, we, we see the, uh, the TVA popping up here uh, as a negligible market for the renewables because, um, well, you have cheap electricity. It's hard to compete against that. Right? But um, in other states with more sun um, and more expensive electricity, there are, there's the potential to install it, but you may be limited, in fact, by the grid. There was a big new study released, uh, I believe it was this week, by the MIT Energy Initiative on, on the future of the grid. Um, yeah? Power Purchase Agreement. Uh, so that's the, uh, the uh, incentive mechanism um, that wh whereby you can begin putting the solar panels on your roof and uh, the installer pays for the panels, gets the money from the bank, installs them on your roof, you sign the contract to pay a certain price for the electricity over the next 12, 15, 20 years. 
So global trends in R&D, uh, this is, uh, a, a, again, a, a data dump of, of several sources, one from the NSF uh, showing uh, industry R&D expenditures, um, government, federal government, and other. And you can see in the United States, this is, this is across all sectors here, but really an inversion of the role of industry and federal government. Right? So when you hear uh, you, you, MIT, for instance, going after large companies and saying, hey, you should invest in R&D here at MIT, uh, this is one of the fundamental driving forces. Right? This is this inversion here, or the decline of federal government spending. And um, it as well is, is, is uh, resulted in, in, uh, in MIT looking elsewhere for funding, uh, not only industry. Um, the greatest gains in R&D intensity in terms of uh, uh, the, the R&D expenditure have been in Asia. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side of this chart, China, Japan, and Korea um, uh, increasing the expenditure from 1997 to 2007. Uh, this was right before the financial crisis hit. Uh, in the US, uh, holding relatively constant as a percentage, as a share of GDP. Um, science, and, uh, science and engineering interest in Asia. This is uh, science and engineering degrees as a percentage of new degrees. Um, you can see over here we have Germany, Korea, and China. Germany makes a lot of sense. The um, Germans have about 44,000 engineering jobs uh, in renewables right now that are unfilled. Right? So they, they need people. They need people to go to Germany to, to get uh, high-tech jobs. Um, China is, uh, is, is a bit more precarious in the sense that the supply and demand is much more evenly matched, and the growth of both are increasing at steady rates. Uh, so if the growth of manufacturing and, and R&D does not continue to rise in China, uh, there's going to be an oversupply of people. And that can lead to a number of problems. Um, and so the, 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 it's very important for China over the next several years to keep a strong, uh, steady handle on, on this growth, to make growth manageable. It's a good problem to have. It's managing success. Um, but it could also lead to some catastrophic consequences if the system gets uh, uh, out of balance. Um, in the United States, uh, well, I believe this data came from 2005. That was at the height of, of uh, financial engineering. Um, I would hope that this number here has is, is increased a bit uh, since the, the collapse of, of the financial markets um, and a recognition that there are, are uh, productive ways of investing one's talents uh, and, and mental gifts. Um, global research output shifts towards Asia. Uh, this is um, global research R&D, share of, of, of uh, science and engineering articles. So if you're starting from a small amount and growing, um, you're going to be, by, if, you, if you just look at in, in a percentage basis, by necessity taking away a share of the pie from another uh, uh, entity. So as uh, China grows, India grows, uh, the rest of the world grows, um, the share of, uh, of articles, science and engineering articles in the US and in the EU uh, begin to drop, essentially the, the, the dominant players, and in, in Japan as well. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing if the quality of the articles is maintained and the total number of articles continues to expand and we have the capacity to keep up with the information, right? So there's a, there's a threshold or a limit to how much we can absorb, how much information, new information we can absorb per unit time. So people are working on more sophisticated ways of gathering and assembling this information, especially using computers nowadays that can help uh, ex expedite uh, R&D. So a number of, of trends happening uh, on the scientific side, you're involved with that. Um, High-tech trade balances continue to widen. Um, this is uh, the, the trade balance in te uh, high technology goods, US and China. Um, and so the, the uh, obviously Chinese um, economy sh trending away from, well, still heavily invested in uh, raw materials, but trending away from that toward high-tech manufactured goods uh, in the US. Um, entering a, a region of, of uh, uh, trade deficit as a result of purchasing those, those products. So these are all trends that have policymakers in particular um, concerned and, and, and looking at, at the future of, of global competitiveness. Technology evaluation. Let me spend a couple of words bringing all of what I've just said and everything over the entire cl uh, course home to you. So, so far we've talked about this, these, these things in very ethereal terms. It's useful information. It will prove useful once you uh, begin applying it. But we want to run through a, a quick little scenario right here where you're asked to evaluate a new PV technology. Why? Well, you might be applying for a job at this company and they say they have the greatest thing since sliced bread 
and you want to put on your thinking cap and evaluate whether that's true or not. You might have a new idea or new innovation, and you're trying to make the, the, the tough call. Do I go forward and establish a company off of this idea, or do I have to go back and turn the crank a few more times to come up with the next better idea um, that's more worthy of investment? Um, you could be an investor. Uh, you could have money at your disposal, and you could decide what company to invest in or what not to invest in. So how do you go about this? I would say three fundamental components. Um, and, and venture capitalists might disagree with me, or other people who have different skill sets might disagree with me. But me, from this pers perspective, as, as, a, as an engineer, I would say first analyze the physics. Figure out how this technology works. Right? Because if you understand how the technology works, you can understand some of the fundamental limitations, you can understand efficiency limits, and you can predict, based on pattern recognition, how hard is it going to be to obtain or, or to approach those limitations. Analyze the cost scale. Uh, scale potential, meaning the potential to scale up, and manufacturing. Um, this is really more in the engineering science side, and we've been getting more into this during the second and third parts of the course. In analyzed markets, this is definitely the third part of the course. So this begins to pull it all together, right? Let's start with analyzing the physics. Um, we talked about conversion efficiency being a strong lever for costs. That's why we're analyzing uh, conversion efficiency. The way I would recommend analyzing any PV technology that they throw at you um, would be thinking about conversion efficiency in terms of output energy versus input energy. And think about losses along each step of the way. If you have time with the R&D department, sit down with them. Sit down with some of the, the chief engineers and walk through each of the steps going from a light uh, photon entering the, uh, the, the, the device uh, to charge being collected on the other side with a certain um, current voltage characteristic. And keep in mind that the total efficiency is going to be limited by whatever the worst performer is. And keep that picture in mind, too. Be big advice. Customer needs. The next is, is analyzing what, what makes your product special. Right? So where, where is it going to fit into the, the, the big picture? Um, is it going to run with the big dogs? Is it going to be an on-grid uh, application, in which case cents per kilowatt hour really matter, the price for the electricity, for a power purchase agreement? If you're just selling the module, maybe dollars per watt would be an important metric as well. Or are you going into one of these other niche markets right over here? And are you going to be a player there? How big is that market? These are some questions to ask. Cost. All right, so now that we know what our intended market is, we know what our, our product is going to look like. Um, we know the physics behind it. Uh, we know, in, in a bit, we'll, we'll know more about the manufacturing. We, we think about cost. And we talked briefly about this during class. We had more of an in-depth discussion with Doug. Um, that Excel spreadsheet, by the way, will be available to you. So you can look through it and see how a cost analysis was done for crystal and silicon and how you might adapt it to your technologies. But it's really important to, to perform a cost performance model for your technology so that you can understand what levers to pull, what levers need to be pulled uh, to increase your uh, parameter of merit, whatever that parameter of merit happens to be for your potential customer need. Manufacturing technologies and scale really do play into this quite a bit. And for many technologies, or for many companies, in, at least in the Silicon Valley area, um, there might be 50 companies working on the same material, copper, indium, gallium, diselenide, let's say, SIGs. But they each have their own deposition process, and they're each trying to develop their own pieces of equipment to manufacture this uh, material. So understanding the basic differences between the different deposition systems is important, and we walk through that during our Thin Films lecture. So again, you have access to this information, and you can parse through it uh, in greater detail should you need to. Scaling of manufacturing. We talked about resource availability. We even had a, an in-class debate about it, uh, about cadmium and tellurium. Um, there are reports out there which you have access to, like this APS report on critical energy materials. And uh, we understand that the manufacturing and, re and reserves of these elements are not equidistributed. Uh, in fact, they're concentrated in certain regions of the world. And so that might influence uh, the ultimate potential of a certain technology to scale. And again, this is another intelligent question that you can, a set of questions that you can ask. We understand a bit about the market dynamics now. We understand uh, this is price. Um, we understand that there was a bit of a plateau in price in the mid-2000s, a precipitous drop over the last three years. And that's really uh, changed the way that uh, uh, investments in equity look at the solar market. In the mid-2000s, it was all gangbusters. Everybody was really happy to throw any money they had at solar. Um, now, um, people are a lot more selective in terms of what they invest in. Um, and this, is, this trend of, of oversupply, undersupply, 
uh, is probably going to continue for some time um, if, if the integrated circuit industry is any example and model. Uh, so we're, we're likely to see um, this continue. What is your market timing? It might be a really good time to found an installation company right now if you can scale and grow quickly and you have the right niche. Um, but if, you're many, if you have a new idea for a thin film absorber, um, it's important to think critically about where the market is going to go over the next few years and how that impacts your strategy as a company. You might decide, well, the you know, market's kind of, kind of uh, cold right now for, for modules, so why don't we hold back on building that large-scale manufacturing plant until, say, 2014 um, and invest really heavily in R&D right now and stay small uh, without the, the financial obligations of a big manufacturing line uh, until we really nail the technology and have something good to go. And plus, think about our exit strategy. Maybe we won't ramp up to be a, a gigawatt or two gigawatt company. Maybe instead it's more important to form partnerships with companies that are manufacturing Cattel or SIGs right now. So our business developer is going to spend more time chatting with uh, the, the business developers of First Solar and, and uh, other companies. Um, we also know a bit about the financial incentives from Germany and some of the largest uh, PV markets in the world. We know that China uh, is going to ramp up uh, significantly in terms of, of installations over the next few years. Uh, we know that the United States will as well as the, the, the prices continue to come down. Uh, these are the uh, PV feed, feed and tariff rates shown in blue and red for different types of installations, blue being the uh, uh, large um, freestanding systems, the red being uh, mostly uh, uh, rooftop mounted systems. Uh, so we saw that the feed-in tariff rate in Germany has come down versus time, and the average electricity price has gone up. Right? So we can begin predicting what uh, the role of market subsidies will be uh, when we try to roll out our technology onto the grid. And we can plot this and, and see how that will impact our business model as well. And lastly, we know that about 99% of the solar panels have yet to be made. 99% right? of the solar panels have yet to be made. So there is a lot of potential here. This, uh, again, going back to the very first lecture, where we had new energy installations, new PV installations growing significantly, right? Convergence is coming. Um, who's going to comprise? Who's going to bridge that gap? Who is going to be uh, the maker of the technology that will ultimately uh, bring PV to a, a massive scale on the grid? Um, that's for you to decide. So uh, other intangibles uh, in terms of evaluating companies would include the team, uh, especially the leadership team. What is their track record? Uh, what is their philosophy of running the company? Uh, the financing that's available, how much cash is at hand? Um, the patent portfolio, how well protected are they? And, and so forth. Patents, by the way, vary in importance from the US uh, to certain other regions of the world. Uh, it's very important in the US and Europe, less important in China. Um, but it depends, uh, if, 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 a, if a certain idea is patented, um, you will have difficulty accessing that market you will have difficulty selling product into that market, even though you can continue to sell a mark, uh, product into markets that value patents less and IP. So let's go through a few examples. I'm going to throw a couple of examples at you real quick and just spout off uh, the first ideas that come to you. How would you analyze this company? Solar paint. All right, so I, I have my, my big spray paint system here, and I go to the side of the house, and I go shh, and that saves me a bundle on installation costs. It's easy. You can do it yourself. And you just connect a few wires, and voila, you have solar electricity. What would be your first instinct? How does it work? How does it work? <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. What is the physics behind it? How do you separate charge? If you go back to this right over here, right? light absorption, charge excitation, it's important. What, what's the band gap of the material? How, how, what, what, how does it excite charge inside of the material? Uh, wh where is charge separated? Um, how do carriers reach those separation points? I mean, you're just spraying on one homogeneous layer. Did I get that right? There, there's, no, like, there's not like two layers. Does it phase separate? How, how does that work? And in charge collection, how are you collecting the charge over that massive area? What are your resistive losses and so forth? So you're, you're equipped now to ask those questions as a result of this course. That's pretty awesome. If you think about it, you're, you're pretty empowered. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it could work. Solar paint could, could very well work. So it's important not to ride into this discussion with a high horse and say, oh, it won't work because of X, Y, and Z. It's important to keep an open mind because new ideas are really quite startling and, and they can be uh, game changing. But it's important to have a critical yet respectful approach to this, right? A critical mind uh, is, is always a good thing to have on your shoulders. Wundermaterial. Um, 
So I'm, I'm arriving to you and I say, this is the wonder material. It's all earth abundant, totally scalable. Um, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> See, you're going to have to invest in my company because I have this great team right here, a great team coming from Intel. Uh, I, I used to be a head manager at a national laboratory. Um, I know my stuff. I really know my PV. I can wow you with a few presentations about PV device physics and talk all this fancy stuff. But you're going to have to invest in my, my, my company based on a few SEM images, plain view SEM images of the material structure, just to prove that I can actually deposit it. But I'm not going to tell you what the material is because USVCs could run off with my idea and go sell it to somebody else. Uh, so I'm going to hold that very close to my, my, my chest. Do you invest in me or not? Depends how much you're asking. Depends on what you're asking, depends how much you're asking for. That was a real situation. I was in that room. I was evaluating that company. And as a scientist in that room, I was like, are you serious? You can't be serious. Um, the venture capitalist, however, thought differently and said, look, the team is really good. And um, I, I think, uh, you know, for, for, for reasons that, that were described, um, I can't get into all of them uh, without giving the, the details away, um, there were reasons for investing in that particular case, in that company. And even though the physics was not understood, and even though the ultimate efficiency potential was not understood, the VC firm made an investment. Um, so far, it's been going OK um, with that company. So uh, just to point out that this is a base, a foundation of which to make decisions. It's not a, a, a prescription upon which to make decisions. Right? Uh, a lot of things uh, factor in. Use your best judgment. You're the one best equipped to, to make those decisions. Path forward. Um, this is kind of my last uh, uh, few words on the soapbox before I hand over the microphones to you. Uh, the path forward, from my perspective, the markets are going to drive a lot of the public story. Uh, but you know that cost matters more than price, right? Price is the short-term uh, market pull uh, during the mid-2000s. Uh, well, actually, down here, when, when the, the price was still very, very high, um, solar was kind of this hippie, uh, uh, tree-hugging uh, group of, of nerds that would get together at the, MIT, uh, at the Muddy Charles and, and come up with the facts-based analysis, which formed the MIT Energy Club. Really small thing. And then right when uh, the prices began to, to stabilize and, and um, there was a, a, this, this view that energy was this huge gold mine waiting to be explored, um, a massive amount of interest came into the field and growth accordingly. Uh, and it was good. Um, but in the uh, 2008 and so forth, we had this precipitous drop in prices, as well as the collapse of, of finance to allow these technologies to scale up. The valley of death widened and deepened a bit, if you will. And suddenly, energy looked a lot more precarious. Um, started having students come into my office during interviews saying, what, what sort of career can I have here? No, tell me, seriously, are, are there jobs waiting for me when I exit? Um, the reality is there are jobs waiting for bright, smart people, regardless of the market condition. There were jobs back here. There will be jobs in the future as well. Um, if you're good at what you do and you ask the right questions, um, conduct good experiments and know how to disseminate your work. Um, but uh, this is kind of a, a return to the roots now, where we have people who are in solar and interested in solar who are really there uh, for, 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 for the long run. And so knowing the market conditions really helps you put everything into perspective and see how, how the situation might evolve going forward. In terms of tipping point, um, it's largely agreed upon that a dollar a watt system installed um, is, is really where we want to head to. So we know the cost right now of manufacturing a PV module, crystal and silicon, is in the order of a dollar per watt. And if you're inventing a new technology, um, you have to do uh, half of that, right? And crystal and silicon has a roadmap to get to about 50 cents per watt peak by 2020, 2025. And so if you're developing the new technology, you have to undercut that in some way, shape, or form. And you can do that in a variety of ways. Improving the efficiency. There's a lot of headroom in efficiency. A lot of headroom there. Um, maybe uh, manufacturing scale and so forth. But if a technology, some technology, by 2020, can get to a dollar a watt installed, we're looking at, by 2030, a pretty massive grid penetration of PV across the United States. And that's just the start of it. The US is just um, the, the drop in the bucket. This is the world. There's a lot of people, 1.6 billion of them approximately, without electricity right now. They're coming online, and they're driving the majority of the growth in CO2 emissions. Majority of the growth comes from two points. One, um, we're outsourcing our CO2. right? If you look at the amount of CO2 the United States contributes to the world, it might be one-fifth. 
But if you look at all the manufactured goods, all the clothes we're wearing right now, all of the apparatus that we're using, right, these were manufactured probably not in the US, but they're here for our consumption and use. We own that carbon. That's our carbon. We're responsible for it. So our footprint increases further. So we're outsourcing the carbon. It's, it's growing in, in certain developing regions that are exporting to us. And secondly, um, they're also growing. They're also consuming. They're also getting cars and, and computers and so forth. So um, there, there's an overall growth of, uh, of, of, of uh, consumption around the world. We agree that climate change is an issue. And we look at the solar insulation map and we say, wow, compared to certain minerals or uh, rare earths or uh, petroleum, this is fairly equitably distributed. Even regions, say, in, in Patagonia or up in northern Europe, uh, compared to the equator, we're looking at about a 3x, maybe a 4x delta in solar resource, not a million to zero, <laughs> a million to one, rather. Um, we're looking at a, a 4x delta in solar resource, which is not that big of a spread. And furthermore, if we go back and look at the uh, countries that are really coming online, um, just using this, uh, this loose parameter human development index that we referred to on the first day of class, we can see that the countries with the largest solar resource base, um, several of them also happen to be countries that are on the path toward uh, development, on the path toward consumption. And solar can really have an impact in those countries to improve the quality of life and also reduce carbon emissions overall in the world. So what role can you play? I mean, I, I think um, important things to keep in mind is, is there's, uh, it, we're, we're really at the beginning of solar. We have a lot of headroom to grow. Um, I think the uh, amount of venture capital investment lost so far due to failed companies is a drop in the bucket compared to GDP, is a drop in the bucket compared to military investments, is a drop in the bucket to things that we consider important and especially the, the, the quality of life in the world. So put, it's important to keep that in perspective. We need to maintain momentum, capital, innovation, culture. That's what we have here. It's growing in other places around the world as well. It's important to, to foster that growth and uh, evolve into a global society where we have connections and, and shared connections with, with groups around the world, shared interests, and can leverage uh, each other's strengths. Um, the rest of the world is catching up fast with increased competition. That's why isolation won't work in this case. Um, we do need uh, increased R&D efforts on key targets. I think better investments and smarter choices of technology is important. And hopefully over the course of the class, you're equipped with several of the tools to make those types of decisions yourself. Um, we also need to change the way we innovate. Um, pooled resources, collaborative efforts, um, improve industry university lab relations, which in the US uh, are, are somewhat at a precarious state because of differences in priorities between publications and IP protection and so forth. Um, direct to manufacturing innovations, instead of um, always thinking that startup companies are the only route, thinking in terms of how do I get this technology into a large established company in the US? That's a route that we don't think about very often, but could have a huge impact and certainly has an impact in Germany. Um, the need for a steady, predictable market. All right, I, I think I might be asking too much in this bullet point, but it would be nice. <laughs> and certainly policy can play a large role in that. We, we have enough unpredictability with oversupply and undersupply. We don't need the, the politicians getting into it as well and changing their minds every two years. And investment in education as well, the right type of, of base education. So you can get involved in a number of ways, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and I wish you the best of fortunes going forward. Please feel free to call on me whenever you have a need, and I look forward to your presentation. So be well. Thanks. Mm -hmm.